This is CBC Here and Now. We're talking into the hundreds of thousands of dollars of damage that has been done here in the last three years. They're destructive and dangerous. For a third straight summer, someone is setting fires in Grand Falls, Windsor. Cornerbrook uh, Bay of Islands area is absolutely the epicenter uh, for the theory of plate tectonics. Putting the Bay of Islands on the world tourism map, I'll tell you about a group that's trying to get a UNESCO designation for this stunning area. Heat and humidity returns tomorrow, but how long does it stick around? Welcome to Here and Now, I'm Carolyn Stokes. For the third summer in a row, suspicious fires are breaking out in Grand Falls, Windsor. Police are now investigating fires at an office building, a ski club and a dance studio. CBC's Garrett Berry has more. When the fire was raging, it was just an inferno. What was a skidoo and what was a trail groomer up in smoke? It's heartbreaking because this time of year we're looking at programs and trying to do work to get ready for next winter. And now instead, that whole focus has to be switched to uh, providing gear so that we can, uh, we can groom the trails. For a volunteer group, this rubble shows a big loss. Well, $27,000, $30,000 to replace them. Plus there was at least, my guess off the top of my head, $10,000, $12,000 of ski equipment, just random things, boots, poles, skis. It's another suspicious fire in this community and another suspicious fire right here on the property. The fire chief in Grand Falls, Windsor says he is worried it's only a matter of time until someone gets hurt. Firefighting is an inherently dangerous profession at, at any given time, but of course when fires are deliberately set, it certainly puts firefighters at a very unnecessary risk. And uh, usually these fires, when they're started, they are large fires. Since July, fires have struck a dance studio and the old Islander RV property. Even if the buildings were empty at the time, Mackenzie says every fire is dangerous. People have to realize that once you unleash fire uh, on, in any circumstance, it becomes uncontrollable and uh, you, you cannot contain it. Each fire next to a wooded area. I'm not privy to all the inside information, but obviously we recognize that it's not a coincidence that we're seeing a lot of these similarities around locations and types of structures that are uh, being set fire to. So uh, we're hopeful that the RCMP will be able to catch someone soon and we can put this uh, to rest. Police tell us they are investigating and are asking for public tips. I'm not sure uh, what I would say to the individual. I had to question uh, what their frame of mind is to be uh, doing this sort of thing uh, on purpose and setting these fires. I believe that they're going to get caught. Here at Barry, CBC News, Grand Falls, Windsor. Well, more information tonight on that deadly crash on Pitts Memorial Drive. A 58-year-old man from St. John's was pronounced dead at the scene yesterday afternoon. The call came in just after 2.30 in the afternoon that a vehicle had flipped on Pitts Memorial Drive near Southlands Boulevard. Both, both east and westbound lanes were closed for several hours. The driver of the vehicle was taken to hospital Tuesday with serious injuries, though police say his life is not in danger. The 58 year old was a passenger in that vehicle. Police are asking anyone with dash cam video of the accident to contact the RNC or Crime Stoppers. And as you saw in that footage, the overturned vehicle fell between two highway overpasses. A little later in the show, I'll speak with a couple from Garnish who have long pushed for improved highway overpass safety. Barbara and Ruben Noseworthy lost their daughter and Ruben's mother in a similar crash in 2005. I, I travel the highways of Atlantic Canada fairly often. And all the overpasses that I see, most of them anyway, the guardrail turns in and down into the ground. I mean, you look at these overpasses in Newfoundland, the guardrails just, just turn into the ground. They don't turn in. So if they turned in, you would avoid an accident or avoid a car going out there in the first place. And it might still be an accident, but it won't be a fatality in nine chances out of ten. We'll have more of my conversation with the Noseworthies a little later in the show. 
Well, police in Bay St. George are cracking down, arresting three people for drunk driving in just five days. On Friday, a 58 year old man was stopped after driving an ATV onto un oncoming traffic on the main road in Lourdes. Breath samples showed more than twice the legal limit. And then on Sunday night, an erratic driver was reported in Stephenville Crossing. Police say a 45 year old man was nearly three times the legal limit. He was also operating a vehicle without registration and without insurance. And yesterday evening, a 55 year old woman was stopped near Bereshwa Brook. She also failed a roadside breath test. Well, a Mount Pearl man will spend the next three years in a federal prison for an armed robbery and standoff with police in 2018. Justin Wiseman held police off for seven hours on March 13th of that year after robbing a Marie's Mini Mart with a knife. He was eventually taken away from the home by ambulance after a dramatic standoff. Today in court, Wiseman was sentenced to seven and a half years in total, but given extra credit for the time already served. The judge was sympathetic to Wiseman, who suffered severe trauma as a child and has struggled with alcohol abuse. He's reportedly turned a corner while in custody and will have a little over 1,000 days left to serve. Well, a new app to help notify people who've been exposed to COVID-19 is rolling out across the country. But right now, it's not supported in this province. Here in us, Peter Cowan joins us live with more. So, Peter, I thought Newfoundland and Labrador was developing its own app. What happened to that idea? Carolyn, they put a lot of effort actually into developing an app here with the idea being that it would help keep track of who you've been in contact with and notify you if any of those contacts has tested positive for COVID-19. But then the federal government said, hold on, we're doing our own app. And that's when the province kind of took a step back and said, okay, we'll let you do your thing. So let me tell you a little bit about how this app actually works. So it uses Bluetooth technology to talk to cell phones around you. So if you get closer to someone for less than two meters for more than 15 minutes. Uh, it doesn't identify individuals, it sends sort of random codes, but if you test positive, then the people who are close to you are able to get a notification. It's up and running in Ontario, but the health minister here says it's likely going to be a few more weeks. They're still working with the federal government on some of the tweaks that are needed in order to have it up and running. So we kind of changed streams. Uh, we followed on behind that. It's rolled out in Ontario, uh, and we are in the final stages of discussions with the feds now about our own rollout. I can't give you an exact timeline. Um, when uh, last we discussed this, the answer was soonish, which I would take to be maybe three or four weeks. Now, if you want to, you can actually already install the app either on an Android or an iPhone. It's called COVID Alert, and it will start working right away in terms of keeping track of those contacts. The only thing is, if I tested positive right now, I'm not able to enter the code that would then send the alert to the other contacts. But if you want, you can put this in place right now. The app has faced some criticism. You need a newer phone, uh, one that was built in about the last five years, so some people with older devices aren't able to use it. But uh, Carolyn, it will be a couple weeks before the full functionality of this app uh, is available in this province. Very interesting. Thank you so much, Peter. That's here and now's Peter Cowan reporting live. Temperature checks will soon be mandatory for travelers at St. John's International Airport. Starting at the end of September, passengers won't be able to fly if their temperature reads above 38 degrees Celsius on two tests. Now, if that happens, they'll have to rebook their flight 14 days later. Temperatures will be taken at security screening checkpoints. The country's four largest airports started mandatory testing last week. Long-term care workers at Agnes Pratt and St. Luke's facilities in St. John's are protesting staffing issues. Workers say they're being mandated to stay at work, being refused leave, and they're working short-staffed. Health care. We care. Health care. We care. There's days where they're actually short-staffed. There's days when there's staff on the evening that they don't actually need. Uh, we have staff that's actually been mandated. They come to work at 8 o'clock in the morning, expect them to get off at 8 o'clock in the evening. We had one yesterday, didn't get off till 12 o'clock that night. Uh, under days off, the phone is constantly ringing. To come back. These jobs are stressful at the best of times. 
Uh, we've just seen what happened in long-term care across the country. When you have a day off, you're expecting that mental, physical break, not to have your phone ringing, and sometimes when you answer then, you're actually mandated to come to work. So it's causing a, a lot of concern, and of course the residents then pay the ultimate price. The staff are saying they're not getting sufficient time to spend with the residents, because it's not only about the physical work, you got to be able to support the residents mentally just at the conversation with them. That just doesn't happen. They're in this profession because they care. Uh, and they come home quite upset knowing that they're not putting in or not able to do what they need to do on a daily basis. They have to listen to you to fix the problems that exist in long-term care and in health care in general. It got to a point where I think the term we use, it's a breaking point, it's beyond that breaking point actually. Uh, these staff and a couple of sons are tired of being tired and they are. They're actually physically and mentally exhausted. And in fairness to government, up to around Christmas, there have been a cooperative effort, ongoing discussions where we've actually increased the number of classes in our public colleges uh, in a number of communities. But that remedy is nine to 18 months down the road. In long-term care, this is people's home. It's had a certainly effect uh, from people's mental health perspective, from staff and residents, absolutely. Well, the Newfoundland growlers are pushing back the puck drop because of the pandemic. The ECHL is delaying the start of the season, but is still planning on a full 72 game schedule. With the delay, the growlers won't be taking to the ice until December 4th instead of October, like originally planned. At least that's what the league is anticipating right now. The team says the decision was made to decrease the risk of spreading COVID. Well, the West Coast is going after another UNESCO destination. The area offers scenic hikes and remarkable geology, and one business owner believes a United Nations stamp could change tourism in the region. Here and now's Colleen Connors has more from the Bay of Islands. Even on a moody day, the Bay of Islands views are stunning. Well, this is the theory of plate tectonics. Uh, and Rob Thomas wants the world to know it. This area is an aspiring global geopark seeking the United Nations designation, which is awarded to sites and landscapes of international geological significance. In order to get into the club, you have to have distinctive geology, and we have that. Thomas co-owns this restaurant tucked between the mountains. He offers fresh seafood, zodiac tours, and guided hikes. His restaurant also houses the Cabex Geopark Info Center. And I had no idea until I started this that Cornerbrook uh, Bay of Islands area is absolute, absolutely uh, the epicenter uh, for the theory of plate tectonics. And we've got some maps on the wall that prove this. Um, and it's very exciting stuff. And people like to uh, learn about the area when they come to have a dinner or go on a boat tour. One nice thing with the geopark, we're able to incorporate the geology you know, into our tours and tell people you know, you know, this rock does this, this, this process happened here, and a lot of people really like that. Thomas and a committee of volunteers are seeking the UNESCO designation to put the area, its history and culture on the world tourism map. Not only our business, but everyone else's business. You know, people come to the area, and there's a traveling group of people that come to UNESCO uh, products, you know, like Gross Morn is well known. Uh, Terra Nova is well known, and there's people that you know search out that product. Having having that designation gives the West Coast uh, the opportunity to just drive more traffic, and we all want more traffic. We want more people in our hotels, we want more people in our restaurants, and there's no better way to do that with that UNESCO stamp. They've partnered with researchers at the University of Alberta to prove the area has geological importance. Researchers were supposed to compile data this summer but collection was postponed because of COVID-19 travel restrictions. It's not clear when the Cabot's Geopark will get that lucrative UNESCO designation, but the group here will continue to work towards that goal, all while promoting the local tourism. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Femois Cove. Well, we're launching a new segment here at CBC NL called On Your Street. We're handing the microphones over to children and young people to share stories from their communities. This week, we're hearing from aspiring reporter Lenora Cody. Lenora is six years old from St. John's, and she brings us this report from Scenic Salvage. On your street, ooh, ooh, ooh. on your street, ooh, ooh, ooh. on your street, ooh, ooh, ooh. on your street. He, he, he. Hi, my name is Lenora and I'm six years old. 
uh, I'm gonna climb the hills and trails of uh, the net point in Selvage. Always remember that when you go for a hike in the summer, water, sunscreen, and fly do In case there are any flies traveling around you, they'll just go in. I like it. Here it's so, the air is so fresh and salty and the little fishies swim around in the water. And look at the scenery, it's so beautiful and wide. Okay, fun fact about the ocean, um, it's like a three layer cake. You might have heard this like three or four times, but it has the sunlight zone, the twilight zone, and the moonlight zone. Now, well, fun fact about dragon seahorses, um, when they're together and they're happy, they do a dance and they change color. And look over there at all the teeny tiny islands. They, you might be able to fit them in your finger, but when you actually get there, they're gigantic. This is the Nari here reporting from Selvage. Back to you, CBC. On your street. Well, that was adorable. Uh, great job, Lenora. Thanks so much to six-year-old Lenora Cody for that wonderful story from Salvage. And if you have a budding reporter who may have a story for us, you can head to cbc.ca slash nl and click the community tab at the top of the screen. I've enjoyed the summer a lot differently than I would have in previous years. It's a beautiful day for the Royal St. John's Regatta. However, for the first time in 80 years, there's no regatta this year. I'm Jeremy Eaton down at the lake, and I'll have that story coming up on Here and Now. A little bit unsettled through the day tomorrow for parts of the province, but a nice stretch of summer weather is on the way. I'll have all those details in your full forecast coming up.
This weather update is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. This year, it's Stay Home Year, the year to rediscover home. Ashley is here now with a look at the weather forecast. Happy would-be regatta day to you. Uh, it would have been a wonderful regatta day weather-wise. It definitely would have that uh, a nice, comfortable day today. We got rid of that heat and humidity, but yes, yeah, an absolutely gorgeous day so far this afternoon. And uh, it was a little bit of a cool start, though, certainly through parts of central. Let's take a look at those temperatures. Your morning low for Badger sat at 2 degrees this morning, 11 in St. John's, and then a couple of areas uh, around Twillingate, St. Anthony, and Cornerbrook all see those single-digit highs earlier this morning. They rebounded quite nicely, though. Look at the temperatures across the board. 25 degrees in Gander. Badger saw a high near 26, 27 in Cornerbrook. But, yes, more comfortable. We didn't see uh, as much humidity as we did the last couple of days. Another warm one up through Happy Valley Goose Bay. And Makovic uh, sat around 27 degrees today. Those current temperatures lost a few degrees in St. John's, currently sitting around 18. But still a beautiful evening uh, for Cornerbrook still sitting at 27 degrees. We did see that area of cloud cover and showers move in this morning uh, from trop the remnants of Tropical Storm Isa Iez, and that's going to bring uh, the potential for some thunderstorms overnight for areas in Lab West. Otherwise, a virtually cloud-free sky today for most of the island. You see uh, some cloud cover, though, along the south coast, and that is going to bring in some showers as we head through the overnight tonight. This is a warm front that's moving in, and that's going to bring in some of that more warm and humid air uh, by the time tomorrow morning rolls around, but again, with that risk of some showers through the night. Temperatures will be much warmer than last night, 13 to 17 degrees, but the winds will stay breezy, anywhere from 20 to 40 kilometer per hour winds. And again, that risk of thunderstorms in Lab West going down to about 13 degrees tonight, and you'll note your winds will pick up as well. Through the day tomorrow, that warmer, more humid air will move in. It does look like a risk of widespread thunderstorms possible up through the big land. And then uh, even some thunderstorm activity possible for parts of central and uh, even on the west coast as well. But with uh, sun and cloud in the mix for sure. Down along the south coast, southern Avalon, you could see some showers, but this will more than likely not be thunderstorms. Areas in the northeast should stay cloud free through the day. But... We mentioned, or I mentioned, the return of that humidity. So the dew points are really jumping up tomorrow. It's going to feel much more humid than it has uh, anywhere from Humidex Valley is between 30 to as much as 33, 34 uh, as we head through the day tomorrow. And into uh, Friday, even though temperatures will drop a little bit, we're still going to hang on to that humidity with uh, dew points nearing the 15, 16 degree mark. And that will uh, generally stick around as we head through Saturday as well. So here's your temperatures, 25 to as much as 29 through central. It'll be a little bit breezy out of the southwest tomorrow, 30 to as much as 50 kilometer per hour wind, so it'll help with the heat. But uh, again, that risk of thunderstorms potentially through central and along the west coast as well. Uh, up through Labrador, a little bit cooler than today. Uh, still seeing those mid to high 20s though and then warm down uh, for the southeastern portion of Labrador, 28 degrees in Mary's Harbor. But uh, going to hang on to those cooler temperatures and uh, risk of thunderstorms for Lab City, only reaching a high near 6 degrees tomorrow, 16 degrees tomorrow rather. As we head through Friday, things will eventually clear out. It's leading up to what looks like a beautiful weekend for most. We'll just see some showers move in uh, for Lab West through the day, but temperatures will be a little bit cooler, but again, going to continue to see that humidity. A beautiful summer day, really, on Friday. 24 degrees for St. John's and similar temperatures right across the board. Uh, another warm one for Happy Valley Goose Bay at 27 degrees. And then as we head into Saturday, even nicer weather again, so 22 to 25 degrees. A nice stretch it looks like for the next couple of days until we get into Sunday. A little bit of a disturbance looks like it'll just clip the Avalon so we could see a few showers on Sunday anticipating we will see the sun as well uh, but overall a beautiful uh, week of summer it looks like at this point. Same thing through central and western Newfoundland. Things become a little bit more unsettled by the time we get to Monday uh, but overall those temperatures in the mid to high 20s. 
and then up through uh, eastern Labrador. Same thing, a little bit of rain possible on Sunday, but beautiful temperatures, and then same thing for Lab West. Now, I wanted to share this great shot of a calm morning in Burnside. Robin sent us that lovely shot. Thank you so much for sending that in, and if you have any weather photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Such a peaceful scene. Thank you so much, Ashley. It's a beautiful first Wednesday in the month of August, and that means the regatta should be going ahead. However, much like almost everything else in our lives, COVID-19 has shut it down. So there's no concessions, no food, and certainly no boat racing. And that's certainly gonna have an impact on people like our next two guests, who are very talented rowers. rowers. Alyssa Devereaux, hello. Hey. And Nancy Beaton. Hi. So both of you were on the uh, record-breaking crew back in the 200th regatta, and you both rode last year. Alyssa, how hard was it this year when you found out that there would be no regatta in 2020? Uh, it was pretty hard. Um, I mean, at RH, it's hard to get a crew together, um, six women on the same page that uh, want to train at the same, I guess, intensity. So we had a crew together of six women. I was also coaching a men's crew who had been training since October, um, the NTV crew from last year. So. Um, yeah, it was pretty tough to hear. So it's Wednesday, Nancy. You should be out racing. You should have completed one race early this morning, getting yeah. ready for most likely the championship race. Yeah. So what's going through your head now, just standing on the dock looking at an empty lake? Well, uh, I just enjoyed a delicious croissant, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I slept in and, and got up uh, at 8 instead of the regular, you know, 6 o'clock or whatever it would have been. So it's okay, you know. Like you said, it is what it is, and, and we're making do. It's too bad, and I and I'm sad not to have been, not to have had the opportunity to race with the girls um, that I trained with so hard up until March or April or whatever it was that they announced it was canceled. But you know, it's okay. Everything's a bit different, and I've enjoyed the summer a lot differently than I would have in previous years. Are they gonna crack five? I think they'll be just over. Just over five. Okay. It's a very odd day, to say the least. You know, it's uh, it's saddening that uh, that we're not able to go out and row. Um, however, I've you know said to everybody this morning, we're doing what we need to do to protect everybody. And uh, while I don't uh, don't like it, the reality is it's a necessity, and and we're going to do it, whatever it takes to to move forward and keep everyone safe. Alyssa, can you talk about that? Like, how much training goes into being one of the best crews to ever hit the pond behind you? I mean, it's basically every day. Um, some days, more than one workout a day. And yeah, some people think that maybe regatta training starts in May when the boats go on the pond, or um, maybe in January, but there is some crews that are training year round and, and they might take August off and get back at it in September. So there is a lot of work goes into it. So it's a shame to not uh, see what could have happened uh, come regatta day. So Nancy, does this light a fire under you now to come back stronger next year? Like tomorrow, will you start training again? Or, or, or what happens next? We never stopped. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, sure, yeah. Yeah, I'm excited for next year. It, it'll be good. Number 85. 85. From our perspective, the planning for next year, we're hoping it's going to be bigger and better than ever. We had some all, uh, some really great new ideas for this year that we weren't able to bring forward, but we'll bring those forward next year. And ultimately, at the end of the day, we want everybody to come down and enjoy Kitty Vitty Lake. It's such a beautiful spot. All these new renovations we've done, the Winner's Circle, the new Marquee Dock, and of course the, the dock here for the participants, come down and see it. Right? Come down and, and enjoy it and, uh, and, and sit back and reminisce about the history and the, the days gone by, because that's what I'm doing today. I know a lot of the regatta committees are doing members are doing the same and the, even the rowers I saw here at uh, you know eight or nine o'clock this morning that that's all they were thinking about was last year how good they did and, and how great they're going to do next year so Congratulations to group M5. we're inseparable we have a text thread that is still uh, we haven't missed a day I think without texting since 2016 so it's they're actually all like sisters to me it's it's amazing how six people can and seven really can be so close because Dean our coxswain we're still really close with him as well so it's regatta day. Normally after the championship race, maybe you'd go out and celebrate. Uh, any plans tonight for the crew to get together? Yes, actually, we're going to, uh, and I'm sure other crews are going to be doing it too, but what would have been our crew this year, we're all meeting down here at 6, go for a couple laps around the pond and, have, and then have a beer or two. Nice. Well, if you're missing all those sights and sounds of the regular regatta, here's another dose. This report was filed at Lakeside back in 1994. 
If your idea of a holiday is to get away from it all, the Royal St. John's Regatta is not for you. This is a day-long lakeside party that draws 40 to 50,000 people. We've always come to the regatta since my father took us when we were all only babies. What do you think of having a holiday in the middle of the week? I'm not off today. <laughs> You're working? <laughs> yes, I am. Right. But mostly it's about this, a rowing tradition that began in the early 1800s. It was interrupted only by war, a great fire, and for a time in the 1860s by political instability. But the day of the races has become St. John's biggest celebration. The Canadian government has designated the Royal St. John's Regatta as a national historic event. It's the oldest sporting event in North America. It's also the only place left in Canada where fixed seat rowing survives. That means in these rowing shells, the seats don't slide. Padding's the only buffer against blisters. Pain aside, the sport's got incredible appeal here. With more than 750 rowers, this is the largest competitive rowing club in the country. Every regatta day, I used to come down here and all that stuff, and just watching it, I've always wanted to be out in the boat, and now it's my chance to do it. Old oarsmen like Jack Reardigan figure Canadians might find it an odd sport, but nothing beats Newfoundlanders' love of it. You can row in the, the Henley, and you might get two or 3,000 people. You come down here and row, and you got 50,000 people. Hey, we can break the nine ideas. Come on, go, love you. Let's go, guys. Every year, racers eye elusive records. Every year, there are disappointments. But this evening, on a windless pond, several women's crews beat the five-minute, eight-second record for the course in agonizingly close finishes. For the hometown crowd, though, it was a great show. Tonda McCharles, CBC News, St. John's.
Well, as we reported earlier in the program, there's been another death following a crash on a highway overpass. A 58 year old man was killed when this vehicle flipped on Pitts Memorial Drive near Southlands Boulevard yesterday afternoon. He died on the scene while the driver was taken to hospital with serious injuries. Now that area has a deadly history. In 2015, 21 year old Brandon Lawler's vehicle drove off that overpass and crashed below, bursting into flames. Lawler did not survive. And two months earlier at that very same overpass, a Jiffy cab driver lost control and plunged into the gaps between both lanes. Fortunately, three people saw that crash happen and were able to pull the driver from the vehicle before it erupted into flames. Now he survived one overpass, three separate crashes, two lives lost. Now these accidents bring back painful memories for a husband and wife in Garnish. Their 18 year old daughter Johanna and her grandmother Alice were killed in a similar accident in 2005. This time at an overpass near Carwood Drive. In the years since, Ruben and Barbara Noseworthy have been pushing to make overpasses safer. And Mr. and Mrs. Noseworthy join me now. Uh, I'm sure talking about this uh, opens up old wounds for you. So thank you very much for coming on the show today. You're welcome. Well, it has been 15 years since you endured that tragic loss of your loved ones. And I see uh, that beautiful portrait of your daughter there behind you on the wall. Can you start by telling us how you're both doing today? We're doing fine. Uh, we had to keep going. Our son is still here on the go, and uh, you know it upsets us. And we're we're turmoil every day, but we're doing okay. We've we've managed to uh, take some positive things out of the whole situation, and uh, you know life goes on, and we try to do what we can to honor her life. And yesterday we we saw a similar. Uh, tragic accident on Pitts Memorial Drive. What went through your mind when you heard about that crash at the overpass yesterday? Well, first of all, it's, it, families and another bunch of families are in turmoil and upset and everything. I just think that these accidents can be prevented if they redesign the overpasses. We, uh, we always get heartbroken uh, when we hear of a tragedy anywhere on our, on our highways. Every accident, as a driver, we all have to, to take responsibility to drive safely. And I know um, after um, the, the airing of the last interview we did uh, in 2015, there were quite a few comments that I, I read on your CBC Facebook um, that uh, were pretty upsetting. People assume that Joanna's accident was related to a cell phone or to speed. Not always is it the case. And in Joanna's case, it wasn't that. It wasn't speeding. It wasn't a cell phone. And we'll never know exactly what happened. What bothers us about it is that she was able to go out over. She had six seconds. We know that from the accident investigation to react when she went off that highway and before she plunged over the overpass. So there was nothing there to stop her. Um, and we've always been very grateful that there was no other traffic underneath the overpass at the time, because then there'd be more tragedies involved. Had there been another vehicle or two or three where she landed on Carwood Drive underneath the overpass. So that's something that we've always been grateful for. But we've always wished that even had there been a way that she couldn't get out there in the first place or that there was some way that you can't go over the overpass if you end up out in the medium for whatever reason. Uh, I travel the highways of Atlantic Canada fairly often and all the overpasses that I see, most of them anyway, the guardrails turns in and down into the ground. I mean, you look at these overpasses in Newfoundland, the guardrails just, just turn into the ground. They don't turn in. So if you turned in, you would avoid an accident or avoid a car going out there in the first place. And it might still be an accident, but it won't be a fatality in nine chances out of ten. Wow. 
Right. And this was something that you raised uh, back in 2015, uh, and you spoke with government about it. You know, can there be some changes uh, to these guardrails, to these overpasses, to make them safer? Back then, what was the response you got from government? Was there ever any action? The response was very positive at the time, but nothing was ever done about it. Yeah, we did. We did get to to meet with the minister of transportation at the time and some of his people. And there was some employee who was supposed to be going to a convention coming up that uh, would address that in particular and get back to us. Uh, but I think I think that all happened maybe in the spring or early summer. And then there was an election in the fall, and governments changed, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it all fell by the wayside. Uh, we run out of steam, too. No doubt. We, no. we run out of steam. Yeah. So in the wake of this latest tragedy, do you have a message for government today? I think you need to fix the overpasses. And, and it wouldn't be a, a, a huge amount of money to fix them. It's not like a million dollars, I don't know. Uh, it's, we don't. It's, I don't know how much it's going to cost, but it's not going to cost very much. I don't think, and and the lives that will be saved will be. Well, I th I think this particular overpass at this point uh, certainly should have some sort of of uh, attention paid to it, since we've had three accidents there. Well, Barbara and Ruben Noseworthy, I really appreciate you sharing your thoughts on this very difficult topic. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hope, hope it helps some. Hope it helps some. Thank you. Thank you.
The federal government has signed deals with two big drug makers to help secure millions of doses of COVID-19 vaccines. The agreements are with Pfizer and Moderna. Both are already working on vaccines. These agreements with Moderna and Pfizer are indicative of our aggressive approach to secure access to vaccine candidates now so that Canadians are at the front of the line when a vaccine becomes available. The government hopes vaccines will be ready for distribution across the country next year. Pfizer and Moderna started phase three clinical trials last week to determine how well their vaccines work. Health Canada would have to approve any vaccine before it could be used here. The government has not announced the cost of the deals. Well, a state of emergency has been declared in Beirut, which is reeling in the wake of a massive blast yesterday. The Lebanese government is calling the explosion a catastrophe. Rebecca Collard has more. I'm very close now, about 500 meters away from Beirut's port, and it's been more than 24 hours since this explosion took place, and there are still volunteers just cleaning up the rubble and glass off the streets. It is just absolutely a disaster still down here. In the distance, I can hear ambulances. We understand that the search and rescue crews are still going through buildings in this massive radius that has been affected by this blast, looking for people that might be injured and trying to take them to hospitals here in Beirut. We also understand that those hospitals are completely overwhelmed. The government is now saying as many as 5,000 people are injured, more than 130 people are dead. And that number, unfortunately, is likely to rise throughout tonight and possibly even into tomorrow as, as more people are unaccounted for and as these rescue crews continue to go through these buildings. All day today, there was volunteers that were coming from all around the country to Beirut to help clean up the streets because i don't know if you can see behind me this even this this is one of the not as poorly badly affected area but this is all just glass all over the ground um there's there's uh barriers set up here uh there's down the street there's many shops that have their their windows smashed out and even apartments in this neighborhood which is about four kilometers away from the blast site and a lot of people i'm talking to are saying they absolutely blame the government and they plan as soon as this rubble is picked up that they're going to be back in the streets protesting because they say this is the sort of mismanagement and corruption and neglect that they've been suffering for decades and they're not going to stop their protests. They're going to continue on. Rebecca Collard, CBC News, Beirut. Well, this is the view on Water Street in downtown St. John's tonight. You're looking at Rocket Bakery's new live camera set up just outside the shop. Ashley will be back with a weather recap just after the break.
welcome back. Foraged foods are finding their way onto kitchen and restaurant tables, even in after dinner drinks. Andy Bowman wanted to learn about shaga, a fungus that grows locally on the bark of birch trees. Here's this week's food and fun segment and a note, it was filmed before the pandemic. Distillery in Clark's Beach, where they're using a unique ingredient in a really cool way. We know that everybody here drinks rum, and we've always loved rum. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of chats with a lot of people about how to, you know, the best way to make rum as locally as we could. How did you come, come to, okay, we're gonna combine the flavors of this really rich, like, fungus with rum? How did that kind of come um, to? Funny enough, that came from Sean Dawson, who supplies us with most of our local ingredients. Um, and he said, what about chaga? And we were thinking, yeah, what about chaga? At this point, you're probably wondering, what the heck is chaga? Well, I caught up with forager Sean Dawson to find out. <laughs> Okay, Sean, break it down for us. What is chaga? Chaga is a fungus that grows on uh, old growth birch. It's uh, well known for its nutritional and medicinal values. Um, a lot of people use it just uh, for its antioxidants, so it's really good for boosting your immune system. It's full of anti-inflammatories, so here in Newfoundland, it's really damp climate. It's really good for people with arthritis. Chaga tastes kind of like an, an earthy black tea, but there's actually vanilla in it. So the longer you, longer and slower you steep it or boil it, it'll uh, it'll kind of give off a taste of mocha or something like that, chocolatey notes. I think it would be good. All right, so I finally weaseled my way up in this beautiful, big, healthy, living birch tree. And we got this beautiful, big piece of chaga here. And if you notice to the side, we got a, a few smaller pieces starting to grow. So we're gonna be just harvesting this piece and we're gonna be leaving the smaller ones to grow and spread spores. So when you're harvesting the piece of chaga you found, you really want to uh, be careful not to dig into the tree to remove all the chaga, because you want it to come back. So I'm gonna just try to, try to leave about an inch or so on the exterior and uh, chip off the rest. And here you have it, a beautiful piece of wild Newfoundland chaga, sustainably harvested from the tree. So you see the little bits of black on the exterior here, we're going to leave those and we're going to be careful never to dig into the tree when you're harvesting chaga because there's still quite a bit inside the tree. So Andy, before we go, uh, you up for a spot of chaga tea? Yes, I really want to try some. Cool. Okay, cheers. Cheers. Okay, let's head back to Clark's Beach and try some of that rum next. It's wonderful to be able to sort of use all these natural ingredients. You know, and I know it's not the traditional way that chaga should be used or has been used, but you know, and we can't say that it's now a health drink because no, no. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm not sure we're allowed to say that yeah. rum's healthy. But you know, chaga is definitely good for you. The rum makes you feel well, yeah. <laughs> you know, in responsible quantities. And so together, yeah, we think it should be. A health drink. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, possibly. Really? Okay, Peter, tell us about this drink. This is a Cuba Libra, mm -hmm. which is a very fine drink, but really it's just a rum and coke. A rum and coke? <laughs> with, <laughs> with a little lime? With a little bit of lime. Um, Half a bit of freshly squeezed lime. And yeah, and rum. Rum, chaga rum. Chaga rum and a little bit of coke. I'm very excited. Shall we try it? it? Yes, okay. definitely. Cheers? Yeah, cheers. cheers. Good. 
That's very good. Yeah. Even though I say so myself. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know if this is gonna work. This ratchet strap idea. Who knew that you could even grow that here? It's amazing. We did. Yeah, <laughs> you knew. <laughs> and he's down. Okay, it's really hard to get back up once you get down. Where should Andy go for food and fun? Send her a message. Food and fun at cpc.ca. Ashley's back with a weather recap. So how are things looking uh, in the next 24 hours? Well, we are looking at the risk of some thunderstorms widespread across the big land as we head through the day tomorrow, and even the risk of some thunderstorms through parts of the west coast and central uh, into the afternoon hours. But otherwise, the return of that heat and humidity uh, moves in. We're looking at humidix values in the low to mid-30s through the day. And the good news is that we're going to stick around. This uh, warm weather is going to stick around right through the weekend. So something to look forward to. For sure. Thanks so much, Ashley. Well, normally on this day, we'd be ending the show down at Kitty Bitty Lake. We'd be broadcasting live, taking in the sights and sounds, maybe grabbing some pond side snacks. Of course, the pandemic means everything is different this year. No boats on the water, no big crowds. So in the spirit of what would have been the 202nd running of the Royal St. John's Regatta, a group of local singers, including Petrina Bromley and Tina Madigan, have produced a special video. It's a great take on a pretty familiar tune. We'll leave you with that tonight. Good night.